And now we come to the last talk before it's the question and answer period. So now we're going to be speaking, hearing from Anna Elena Malet on Latin American elegance, an intercultural dialogue. Anna Elena Malet is a Mexico City-based curator specializing in modern and contemporary fashion and design. She's currently a distinguished teacher at the School of Architecture, Art, and Design of the Tecnologico de Monterrey. She's curated numerous exhibitions, um, and please join me in welcoming Anna Elena Malet. Thank you. First, uh, thank you very much to Tania and Melissa for the invitation and for gathering us all here. I think it's very symptomatic that all of us Latin Americans ended up getting acquaintance in the United States. Um, though we have so many things in common and a common language and a common ground, it's always coming to the states that bind us together. For Ramon Maldiosera, one of the leader designers of fashion in Mexico, fashion is the outer personality of an era, the reflection of people, their identity, and their culture. As the designer aptly noted in his definition, fashion arises in response to different identities, whether imposed or constructed, that have developed throughout the 20th century and with regard to the cultural heritage of Mexico and its territory. Valdeosera characterization takes on special meaning in Latin America, a space in transitions, continuous questioning and self-construction, because after the wars of independence, the forging of his nation states was based primarily on the construction of hegemonic identities often associated with the indigenous past, its heroic exploit, and the wealth and romanticization of its pre-Columbian cultures. This mestizo society understood that delving in the past to first detect and then appropriate recognizable elements with traits of authenticity would be a valid operation to achieve a well-defined identity. To illustrate this process, I would like to look at examples of two paintings from the visceral period in American, in American museums. Both showed the tensions between opposing forces on the one hand, the apparent obligation of continuing a repertoire associated with European culture and attire, and on the other, the desire to respond to local traditions and cultures, the latter in pursuit of distinction and authenticity. The portrait of mulatto woman that you see here, signed by Manuel de Arellano and dated 1711 from the Frederick and Jan Meyer collection, now on display at the Denver Art Museum, represents a dark-skinned woman who is bejeweled and apparently dressed in European garb. However, after closer scrutiny, we can see the woman is wearing garments, both from Europe and New Spain, evidently to declare her mixed identity constructed on the basis of two cultures, two worlds, and two, at times, conflicting ideas of good taste and distinction. The mulatto woman wears a, bro a brocade skirt with Gleated hooks or clasps, items associated with European attire. However, the skirt is positioned in an orthodox way because it is not fitted at the waist. Instead, it is dropped over the woman's torso rather like an embrace. On one hand, hanging sensually and delicately over her arm, while the other is left open near her shoulder. The disjoint position of the skirt reveals the enawa, an undergarment whose visibility evokes an uncommon expression of sensuality among the upper classes of the visceral society. A long, rippling coral shawl encircles her body. The woman is lavishly bedded in jewels, wearing a six-strand pearl choker, luxurious rings inlaid with coral, and showy pearls ear pendant that complete her attire. Her head is crowned by a, by a white lace head ornament that according to the description of Friar Francisco de Ajofrin in 1763, was a representative of the native inhabitants of New Spain. The extravagant clothing of the sitter allows us to read that even in a society as segregated as that of New Spain, clothing served as an instrument of self-definition. 
This painting is simultaneously a representation of racial identity and social challenges in New Spain and an allegory of the Americas, the land of the unknown, full of riches evoked as both sensual and desirable. In portrait of a young woman, a Peruvian canvas from the late 18th century in the Davis Museum collection at Wellesley Museum, we can see similar issues to those of the young mulatto woman, a Creole lady that's a descendant of white Europeans but born in the Americas. From high society in Lima, is finally dressed in a fitted jacket, a full lavishly embroidered skirt with a short hemline, better known as pollera, a delicate embellished apron and a dark shawl. The outfit is completed by a luxurious jewelry with pearls and silver, and delicate silk shoes with showy buckles. Although the structure of the attire could be confused with the Rococo style, this type of garb was typical of Peruvian women, both elite ladies and those of the lower classes, and a far cry from the international fashion that was being worn both in Europe and in the visa royalties in the Americas. According to historian to historian James Middleton, the Peruvians sought to define their identities while also seeking comfort in this apparel with elements reminiscent of different European cultures, as well as the strong influence of peasant garments from the region. Both the mulatto woman and the Peruvian Creole lady are presented here with attire laid in reference to European taste associating them with models of elegance and beauty disseminated by the peninsular Spanish in the Americas. <clears throat> However, by communicating their own identity and stacking their claim in the complex, stratified society of visceral times, both women added details associated with their social status, culture, and territory. The mulatto woman, the lace headpiece, and the Peruvian lady, the pollera skirt and the apron. Seeking distinction and belonging in this new world that was actively under construction. The style and fashion represented in these two artworks allow us to affirm that already by visceral times, the inhabitant of this continent used their garment to signal their place in society, to express issues of race and identity, and to confront their own internal tensions as individual in search of defining themselves within a socially complex and multi multicultural universe. The highly dissimilar and apparently contradictory elements of the ultimate mestizo garment led to identities with indistinct borders that permitted multiple and versatile readings as multifaceted as the many ways of constructing, conceiving, and occup occupying the content. I wanted to begin with two historical examples to clarify that the historical process in Latin America are still very much alive and are part of this conversation as we have seen today. So I believe the idea of Latin American elegance today moving among two worlds, the tradition and then the mother, is as much part of the process of miscegenation, mestizaje, as an effective tool of self-representation that brands and designers in the region continue to use and present, and continue, continue using to present a specific image to the world. As cultural critic George Judici has expressed, has express, the cultural capital of Latin America is traditions. As cultural critic, critic George Judiste has expressed, the cultural capital of Latin America, its tradition had not been lost, but rather on the economic pressures of the late 20th century, reconverted. This reconversation and recognition that tradition are not static, but a process in constant transformation, lead us to understand how fashion in Latin America must be anchor much of must anchor much of its discourse in the local and understand that part of its own concept of elegance must come from embracing tradition recognizing the past assuming an ethical stance naming the makers their knowledge and recognizing a cultural richness in constant evolution latin american elegance then is a hybrid phenomenon that implies a dialogue between cultures countries, styles, and images that migrate between territories and imagination. 
a Latin American fashion of global taste. And as everybody, I'm going to use Carolina Herrera and Oscar de la Renta. Only Oscar de la Renta because of time, but Carolina Herrera and Oscar de la Renta are perhaps the two designers who most successfully conquered the United States market in the second half of the 20th century. Although both were upper middle class immigrants living in the United States, they always identified themselves as Latin Americans, even if their fashion project responded to global trends. The styles of Herrera and de la Renta were described on countless occasions in the specialized media as elegant, refined, sophisticated, and in most texts in women's or fashion magazines that review them, they never felt to mention their Latin American origin, as if elegant and distinctions were inherent to their Latin American identity, or better yet, elegance and distinctions are terms used by the fashion media to indicate they are different from European or even American creators. Despite their positioning as Latin American designers and the content's differentiation, the fact is that the inspiration of both and the reference responded to demand in the United States global taste and certain identity quotas necessary in the fashion world. However, and despite the positioning in taste, especially in the United States, Time and again, both designers have looked to the South to seek reference and inspiration. While they claim their Latin American identity in this way, by intentionally espousing their different, thus appropriating that ambiguous place in which the press and critics had pigeonholed them. Oscar de la Renta, 1992 spring collection dedicated to the sensuality of the Caribbean that we see here, is a clear example of this operation. Voluptuous and colorful, this collection presented vaporous dresses and skirts overflowing with flounces. The model, with their carefree attitude, breezed down the catwalk, wearing straw hats and extravagant turbans to the beat of cumbia and salsa music. Feather and reference to exotic birds, exquisite floral prints, sensual necklines with graceful ruffles, and large-scale golden jewelry were no especially striking, were especially striking on the runway. An explosion of color, rhythm, and sensuality enabled De La Renta to appeal to his tropical origin, to bring it to the table as part of his identity and his essence, while integrating it into his repertoire and his marketing strategy. Posthumously, in 2018, the Oscar De La Renta Brown launched the perfume Tropicale, continuing the strategy of associating the designer with the two worlds of fashion, that understated that understated style of the West and the exotic Latin American paradise. Herrera and De La Renta invoke their Latin identity. They'll build their brand from New York, utilizing an hypothetical Latin American discourse. And they distinguish themselves from the other designers on the market, making use of tropical or Latin repertoires that in other designers might be understood as improper appropriation. Um, and this is a term we're using in Mexico and we can discuss later. However, in these cases, their cultural heritage and origin legitimize them and allow them to undertake this appropriation and make this reference. Thus, Carolina Herrera and Oscar de la Renta can live with one foot in each world. Latin American elegance, a glimpse from the South. During the 20th century, the Latin American fashion scene, scene has its ups and downs, concentrating mainly on trying to create local markets that could sustain its existence. It also, at different times, but not as an articulated effort, found echoes in tradition by returning to traditional techniques, local market, and ancestral, and ancestral knowledge, as well as using tradition or, or local iconography as part of a strategy to develop a local repertoire that could be internationally noticed. The 21st century brought the consolidation of internal consumer markets in Latin American countries, as well as a renewed sense of pride for belonging together. Postcolonial discourses and the acceleration of the digital world have entailed new issues and different reflections on the same problems from decades early. The understanding of markets, local and foreign, as well as race, class, national identity, subjective identity and cultural appropriation. For some Latin American designer, it is still valid to pursue success in the United States and achieve the American dream by producing and communicating from New York or Los Angeles. However, 
there are already at least two generations of Latin American designers who have opted to build the global discourse and address international markets from their place of origin. Recovery on personal narratives, family histories, and discourses associated with cultural heritage today are part, of, are part and parcel of the storytelling of collection. A fair numbers of Latin American designers working in small-scale local production, a time associated with indigenous or rural community, have found an ethical and sustainable way of being involved in the recovery and reappraisal of traditions and the generation of well-paying jobs for communities that, are, that were traditionally not associated with the fashion system. The etymology of the word elegance, which comes from the Latin elegancia, means to choose, to choose well. Thus, today a group of Latin American designers have chosen cultural legacy, history, tradition, and territory to create fashion that is local, which implies real and symbolic sustainability that can also be projected into the future and that sets itself apart from the fast fashion that has flooded the world. For example, in Brazil, that is this photograph I have here, we have Rolando Fraga who has asserted, my collections are intended as an encounter between culture and political stance. In each collection, Fraga focuses on telling story, developing issues, and capturing ideas. In 2009, Fraga presented his Disneylandia collection in Brazil and Colombia, which ironically used the idea of Latin America as the real Disneylandia, the real Disneyland, with fantastic characters and cultures that let the imagination run wild. Models wearing dresses with reference to traditional festivals in Peru, Mexico, and Brazil also had hairstyles that seemed huge Mickey Mouse ears. <clears throat> this collection allowed Fraga to propose the idea of a united Latin America thought as a block with a shared ancestral heritage and with common territory and values. For Fraga, this collection seeks to represent the tyranny of colonization with Disney characters. It is believed that in Latin America we have cultural poverty, and I believe just the opposite, said Fraga. The spring and summer collection of 2019, the, the spring summer 2019 collection entitled Las Mudas or, or Las Plántulas was made in collaboration with a cooperative of women seamstress in the region of Barralonga in Minas Gerais, Brazil, after it was affected by the tragedy of the collapse of the Marian Dam in 2015. Fraga gave them the canvas to embroidery plants and flowers from their garden devastated by the tragedy, so that throughout their hands and their, mem and their memoirs, these vegetations, some endemic and others coming from various enclaves of the continent, would exist again in the garments. Brazil criticism in the film has described the work of these designers as poetry, not fashion. The truth is that Fraga spins narratives and constructs not only collections, but also mise en scenes in which line, pattern, fabrics, music, model, stage sets, cultural issues, and stories build the universe. Without romanticizing in Brazil colonial past, Ronaldo Fraga fan, finds a new form of pride and identity construction in its cultural legacy. His garments set apart from others, not only from the notable quality, but above all, for their cultural content. His attire responds to a context celebrating or critiquing situation and issues, social and environmental policies. But at the same time, it is elegant, unique, and responds to a territory and a subjective vision that projects his gaze to what is universal. <clears throat> In Mexico, Carmen Rion has spent more than 25 years collaborating with groups of indigenous women in Oaxaca and Chiapas, creating fashion with a distinctive identity. In 2011, after realizing that the women of the highlands of Chiapas were portraying their own interpretation of the local landscape on their mochevales, their shawls or uh, rebosos, Rion opted to give a workshop in which they, the design process would become conscious. She gave each woman a camera and asked them to take photos of the lo local landscape at different times of the day. Then the women 
were to choose an image to weave and embroider on the Mocheval. This workshop led to a collaboration that resulted in a beautiful collection, an exhibition at the Franz Mayer Museum, and a brilliant runaway show. From observing the custom and process of, of the women in Chiapas, Rion was able to translate the design process, make it conscious for these women, and thus give them tools to continue and even improve their work. Regina Parra Borobiova, no. some experts see Rion as a representative of ethnic fashion, and this trend must prevail because, as stated by Colombian designer and critic Regina Parra Borobiova, the role of the ethnic trend is vital to the preser preservation of local, culture, local, cultural, and ancestral heritage. Rion constructs her garment throughout geometric part patterns largely based on Latin American indigenous legacy, where square and rectangular pieces of cloth are the basis for all garments. The elegance of Rion's design is anchored in the territory landscape and textile legacy, in, in, and textile legacy, in creating unique garments which involve her hands and those of many other indigenous women who add meaning from their worldview to fashion that is Mexican yet universal. The histories of fashion in Latin America have converging points but major difference. Despite similar processes of colonization, cultural language practices and custom can prove to be diametrically, diametrically, diametrically opposed. Colombia, in the case of Amelia Toro, gives us a different perspective of belonging, elegance, and distinction. Trained at the Rhode Island School of Design and the Parsons School of Design in New York, Toro returned to Colombia after working at various fashion houses, determined to create fashion for the world from Colombia. Her fluid and feminine silhouette staged a dialogue with puff sleeve jacks bearing mola textiles that refers to profound Colombia and its great cultural heritage and artisanal tradition. The elegance of Toro pieces resides in the combination of languages, techniques, and materials. She selected the finest, combines in the best way, and produces pieces with unique repertoires, while she communicates style on a global level. Her market is not limited to Colombia, nor to her shop in Bogota. Amelia Toro responds to the season on the international scene. She plays on the stage of Fashion Week and sells in the major capitals of the world. Without any doubt, her fashion is made in Colombia, and she also plays with the idea of mestizo culture that holds this new national pride for local and ancestral tradition. Latin American elegance and distinction are cultural constructions that are renovated and revitalized every so often. Cultural agents, migration, and political and social changes are fundamental factors for understanding their evolution and development. The truth is today, it is unnecessary to construct narratives and projects from the world's great capitals and to generate derivative projects. Instead, it is also, possi it is also possible to influence discourse discourses at the center from the periphery. Today, a renewed pride in cultural heritage, territory, and locality goes hand in hand with an aesthetic that has a lot to do with recovering memory. Thank you very much.